theyeshiva.net. Good evening. Um, Yochanan Poulter here on behalf of uh, Fresh Start. It's an honor to welcome two uh, very incredible people um, that are an inspiration and a source of healing to many in our community. Uh, Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson, whose lectures and topics and insight and um, clarity have, have really uh, taken the Orthodox world by storm. And of course, world renowned Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who uh, has done the same on just a slightly larger scale. Um, and we hope that uh, tonight's open, honest, and raw discussion and QA um, is actually a benefit not only to the participants, but as um, many of you know, Dr. van der Kolk somehow. Uh, chose a uh, fresh start to um, work with us and give us tremendous guidance and I, I and, uh, and supervision. And um, I'm excited that I think Dr. Van der Kolk is also going to learn a lot about our community and where else he can hopefully, you know, give us guidance and learn more about what what's really going on behind the scenes. So, um, with that being said, you know, uh, Rabbi YY, I know that we put together a list of questions and Tova's here. Um, so I'll leave it up to all of you to, to, to moderate. And um, uh, there will be a time for everybody to ask open-ended questions in a little bit. And um, like everything else at Fresh Start, let's just let it roll and, and see where it takes us, right? That's always the best, so go ahead. Okay, so first of all, it's an incredible honor to be together with uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who really, uh, in many ways, changed the world, I think, and uh, allowed uh, our consciousness to evolve and has done so much to allow the mental health community and all of us to understand more of the world of trauma. So here's my, my first question. Can you, doctor, give us a one-minute definition of how do I know that I'm dealing with trauma that's actually running and ruining my life? Because we Jews are cerebral. We know you got to be successful. Right. We work hard. How do I know that my you life is in trauma? cultivated it to um, heights that nobody else has. <laughs> Maybe some Brahmins in India have too. Uh, you know, I don't know how well you know. You know, I think you get to know it in your intimate relationships. You get to know it from experience. Uh, you, you don't know your internal workings until somebody says to me, says to you, you really hurt my feelings. And your first reaction is, oh, you must be crazy that I hurt your feelings. And then they say, actually, you did the following. And you go, I did. And my last girlfriend, who also left me, told me the same thing. Huh, maybe I do something that I'm unaware of. And people are usually unaware of their own processes. And we depend on each other, for better or for worse, to actually give us feedback. Um, and that may be very difficult to take sometimes. Uh, but we learn from experience. And so initially... Everybody who is traumatized feels like, look, they're doing this to me and they're unfair or they're not paying attention or they're not being respectful. And then sooner or later you get to realize, oh, but they, I have a role to play in this. So it's, it, for, I, to, as far as I know, it's always a journey of self-discovery of who am I? And how do I react to other people? And I think when you're young, you don't know that. You actually learn it, and people get mad at you. You think, these are terrible people. They get so mad at me. And it takes a while before you start thinking, hmm, what is it about me that makes people upset or say that I'm hurt? So it's always a part of, of growing up. And 
Right. And then it fell in error, actually. Yeah. Now, now so, so many of us have been in therapy for years, and it's been about talking and analyzing yeah, and dissecting. Yeah, yeah. When do I know that's not working, and why is it not working? Well, People have been 20 years in, in, in talk yeah. therapy. Yeah, but talking is important. But more to discover your own truth than to tell a story. And, of course, the Jews are a great examples of how to tell a story and it's, it's, these are great stories They're very important and stories are important too um but uh, the issue that it doesn't get paid attention to much in psychoanalysis is that stuff lives in your body uh, uh, and so uh, when i feel heard by something you say i feel a sensation in my chest of this guy's hurt is doesn't respect me or uh, and my tendency would become to be angry and so you have a feeling in your body and you really need to really get in touch with that internal experience huh? and to my mind orthodox people are not the expert in getting in touch with their own feelings huh? uh, they can explain things explain things to the the cows come home, but really feeling what they feel and going like... Why I'm, is that? Why? Oh, I, I think it's a, it's a defense. It's a cultural issue. I, mean, the, I think every culture has its way of dealing with trauma. Uh, and, and when you go to, like I was just telling other people today, I've been to China a bunch of times, and in China people do Qigong and Tai Chi. And the first time you see that, you go like, why the hell is there a thousand people in this park making these weird body movements? And you start doing it, you go, oh, because these body movements make you feel calm. Huh? And when you're a persecuted people like the Jews have always been, have being able to explain it and the, in the context of history and the plan of God for you, give you a sense of cohesion, a sense of specialness, a sense of being chosen, of course, very important. When you're traumatized, you don't feel chosen. When you feel traumatized, you feel like a terrible person who nobody else have, have anything to do with. Uh, so that sense of community that comes with uh, rabbinic studies is a very powerful defensive maneuver, which has very good aspects to it. Uh, so several of my uh, best scientific colleagues are, um, are Orthodox Jews because they learn to think so clearly and so logically as a great training to become a scientist. I'm not sure if it's a great training to become in touch with yourself, but <laughs> and the thinking is a very wonderful uh, way. So, You're so saying to get in touch with yourself, you have to stop thinking. <laughs> well, you have to start, start feeling. Uh, and have, feel your emotions, feel your sensations. Uh, and, and, you know, it's also interesting to me is that... Uh, uh, traumatized kids and traumatized adults, they know what to do. And so uh, the davening, for example, is a very interesting thing to see. And when you deal with abused children, they also daven. Uh, it's a way of calming your body down. Uh, and so you guys don't think about when I daven, I'm trying to calm my body down against all the feelings that I have. You think that's just what we do. But you have incorporated a physical uh, ritual that actually helps people calm themselves down. I just want to make sure I understood this. Are you saying that when we shake, when we daven back and forth, that that is a... I, I would say that that had, probably has its origin. And you see it also in, in kids who are upset. Their origin is this is a way I keep my body quiet. It's a way of calming my body down. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, because everybody needs their own methods to just calm that body down. Because when you're traumatized, your body goes all over the place. And so when you go through the rituals, you, you calm yourself down. Hmm? It's amazing because you, you speak about cultural differences. You know, in the Bible in Genesis, Noah, who saved yeah. from the flood, has three sons. Shame, hmm. Cham, and Yafes. I know. And what that means is, Cham means heat, warmth, passion. Yafes ah. is beauty. And shame, the father of the Semites, including the Jews, means names. Yeah. And the commentators say that some cultures are very good with passion, 
uh-huh. feeling the passion and others, European cultures, yafas, beauty, aesthetics. And shame <laughs> is the ability to name things, to give moral definitions. And that's what the Jews excelled in. They say it's the Semites, the African tribes, and the European tribes. Right. And Africans don't do that, but they know how to drum and make music in a way that nobody else does. You know? <laughs> so every culture has its own way of dealing with, with the, the inevitable hurt and pain that we all carry. Yeah. Right. So, so here is, I know you're not a theologian, you're a doctor, but here's the question that comes up after yeah, but, so many I grew years. up, so oh, I, sorry. <laughs> let, let me tell you something about my background. Um, so I, I was born in 1943, uh, like, which I call the worst year of, of human history. And then in 1945, my parents moved to the coast of Holland, uh, where all the houses had been destroyed and started to rebuild houses. And our neighbors on both sides were reconstituted Jewish Holocaust survivors. And in retrospect, I think that the kids were not the kids of these two p- parents who were married to each other in 1945, wow. but they just picked up a bunch of kids and they clumped onto each other and they created a family new. I said, let us be a family. So it were two my both of my neighbors on both sides, and they wow. would take me to Shul, for Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. And boy, do I do I learn about uh, wailing and moaning. I mean, you can just imagine 1946, going to going to a shul uh, just after the war. People were just the Holocaust was just out there, and people were moaning and crying. But how did you remember? You were three years old. You remember? Well, I was four. I probably went to the shul for the first time when I was four, maybe five. Wow. But these were early memories, very early. Wow! Memories. Wow! wow. Which had a very profound effect on me, actually. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that if a person, you know, from some of your lectures and, and your book, the body yeah. keeps the score, it always seems like that so many of our self-defeating and self-destructive behaviors can be attributed to trauma. Do you That's feel true. that if a person was really whole and healthy, emotionally, physically, psychologically, that would really eliminate? the liars, the rapists, the murderers among us, because we're really good and our evil comes from brokenness? Very tricky issue. Uh, I'm also a great fan of Shakespeare. And Shakespeare was truly one of the truly great and extraordinary uh, genius who ever lived. And his plays show us something about human beings. Uh, And when you see Othello and King Lear and Macbeth, that is us. So... We are not a noble species. We have the capacity for nobility, and we have the capacity for amazing things. But we, I think all of us carry also the seeds of great cruelty and awfulness in us. And it depends somewhat on the culture that we live in, how this gets shaped. But we are not cuddly little animals, human beings. Which is why you're saying healing trauma is not enough. We also need to teach values. I think that's a very important issue. And that is, you know, when I and my colleagues, because it's always a very communal enterprise, started to talk about trauma, we thought that if we just took care of trauma, that the world would become a better place. The world hasn't become a better place since we talked about trauma. And uh, the culture is much more trauma sensitive, but we keep continuing to do awful things to each other. I think we are a troubled species. And if I were our creator, which you may find blasphemous, I might think about smiting us from time to time. Wow. So, so that's fascinating. In other words, there could be a person who's not traumatized, who has a good self-esteem, who has good attachment, yeah. Yeah. and they can go on and do something incredibly cruel. I, that, I think that's true. That's very powerful. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. I have another very interesting one. We have a tradition... It's known as Jewish mysticism, Jewish spirituality, Kabbalah, Hasidic spirituality. There's a fascinating idea over there that as the world's consciousness reaches a much more evolved and redemptive state in which we experience our oneness, we call it Geula, time of redemption. The mystics say it's the body that's going to lead the way. 
The soul is going to be nurtured by the body. It's literally an That's expression. That's interesting, isn't it? Huh? One of the greatest spiritual <laughs> masters, the Balatanya, in the 18th century yeah. said, the soul is going to be getting its food from its body. Yeah. Not like we have been used to in our culture for thousands of years. Now, I find this incredible yeah. because... Yeah. You know, you have brought the, the mental health community into an yeah. understanding of the world of trauma. So much yeah. has changed. What's cooking? What's in store for us? What does your hunch tell us? What can we hope for ourselves and our children in the near future in terms of the body really being the center of consciousness? You know, the culture evolves. Uh, 15 years ago, two days ago, the iPhone was introduced to America. Completely changed our world. Zoom has completely changed our world. And we're going to change. And God knows how we're going to change. So we make adaptations to these things. But talking about the body and Judaism, it's fascinating that I did not grow up in a Kabbalistic, um, I didn't see Kabbalah. The people who I, I grew up with were not singing and having ecstatic rituals. I wish I had seen it. Uh, because I'm fascinated that that this Hasidic tradition was evolved in Eastern Europe and came here for our bar mitzvahs afterwards uh, of singing in Havana Gila. And I've always been very intrigued by the somatic, ecstatic aspect of Judaism, which uh, we don't see much on the outside. Uh, but I think it's a very profound uh, tradition that you have that I would very much encourage you to explore further and to celebrate, actually. They have, the, the Jewish mystics have an amazing tradition. In the Bible, in Genesis, God tells Abraham, whatever Sarah tells you, you listen to her. <laughs> really? And and, and this, yeah, and the Kabbalah says that it's a metaphor for the soul and the body. Abraham is the soul and the, and the mind, and Sarah is the body. And God is telling Abraham, you need to listen to your body. You need to listen to Sarah. That's literally what they say. You have to listen to your body. Your body keeps keeps the divine score. Yeah, so when yeah, I yeah. saw your title, I was like, whoa. Yeah. I think that's an amazing tradition. I also learned about the tradition of Shabbos Nachas, yeah. which would definitely not be a Christian tradition, <laughs> which I'm fascinated by, like, wow, the Shabbos is to give physical pleasure to each other. Wow, that's not anything I grew up with. And I think it's beautiful. Yeah, the, the, you know, there's also, it's fascinating, the Kabbalists say, the, the, the prophet says, Zechariah says that the Messiah is going to come riding on a donkey. You know, why, why a donkey? You know, why not a BMW? Why not a limousine? <laughs> why not a horse, a camel? And, and the answer is, the, uh, the word for donkey. The word Rabbi, for donkey. why, why? Yeah. Could I in inter interrupt you and Dr. Bessel? My challenging question is, if... Dr. Bessel, you're so like moved by all these Jewish traditions that are so powerful that we have it in our Bible. And Rabbi Waiwa, you're obviously bringing so many proofs to it. How is it that our culture, Judaism, we are so, I don't want to use any other words here, but we are so screwed up. There are so many people with us on this Zoom call right now that it's so beautiful that we're hearing from both of you how amazing Judaism is, mm -hmm. but we don't feel it, me and all the clients who are on it. We are all hurt and in pain. So it's beautiful that Judaism is nice, but there's so much pain. So we have the two biggest people in the world now over here. Judaism, Dr. Bessel, help us get to the core of that. How is it that with everything that Judaism gives us, there's so many of us who are so hurt. Well, I'm so many people who are still hurting. I'm actually surprised to hear uh, why, why uh, tell us, uh, the injunction of Adam to listen to Eve, because that, of course, is not a, the Orthodox tradition. The Orthodox tradition is to be very patriarchal and to have the men be in charge of everything, for which women pay a very high price, I'm sure, and for which children pay a very high price. If, if the man makes all the rules, there is no dialogue and there is no negotiation. Is it's interesting that some of the more prominent radicals of the 20th century have been Orthodox Jewish women who became secular and became revolutionary. Feminists, feminists, yeah. But I do have to say that some of the great spiritual leaders in the last generation, my own teacher and others, have really tried to help the Orthodox world evolve and really understand 
that in a much deeper consciousness, the woman is an equal partner, and not only an equal partner, but also must serve as a leading figure in the family and the community. Well, I hope you so we are we are it. evolving. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bessel, we're not gonna convert you soon. But now we're gonna talk about the real pain in the Jewish world. So let, let's get let's get back to Tova's valid question. These are all beautiful ideas, Shabbos and davening and shaking. But for many of us on this call and many that will watch this, that has been a tremendous source of pain. And and how is it that something that was, I guess you could say, meant to be so beautiful and obviously impacted you, Dr. Bessel, um, is also the source of, of so much hurt? And Rabbi Yy, you know, maybe maybe this is something you start with. But then you have to come up with specific examples. Huh? And that's why the details are so important. And when people feel hurt, you have to ask, so what hurt you so much? Tell me your story and tell me what has really has broken, what broke you and what makes you feel so desperate. And then people tell you stories. And you need to listen to every single story because two stories will not be the same, of course. So let's be more specific. Rabbi Waiwai, I'm sure you're going to like be familiar with this. Shabbos is more specific. It's beautiful. It's a day of rest. It's all that, all the beautiful stuff that we say about it. But how many people who are here on the Zoom right now, Shabbos is a source of pain because of the way it's presented. And maybe, maybe they experienced... A young man once told me that he was molested every Shabbos in the synagogue when everybody went home, right? Another person was sitting at their table, Shabbos table. We have a beautiful meal, doctor, on Shabbos. And the father was having feats of anger and rage. The children mm. felt it was in a very abusive atmosphere. Mm. They came right. to associate the day with tremendous alienation, right. et cetera, et cetera. So I think... We all have to take accountability in our own lives and realize that the most sacred and beautiful traditions can become extremely abusive mm -hmm. and exploited in very cruel ways when we don't work on ourselves, when we, parents, teachers, right. are not aware of our own triggers right. and we continue to perpetrate right. you know, that cruelty on the next generation. And we need to listen to what our kids say to us. Who are the most honest people in the world? Five-year-olds. And 14-year-olds. Mm. And people say, oh, she's going through adolescence. She's crazy. I Listen to your adolescents. They may be disinhibited, but they may also say some things about what's happening in your family that's worth listening to. And all too often, kids get shoved aside and given drugs to shut them up and put in hospitals to shut them up. And it's really worth listening to what your 15-year-old is discovering about the world, and when they say you're being abusive, it's important to say, wow, I'm sorry you feel this way. Tell me more. Oh, that's what I did, and it's hurt you. It's very important to have the communication go both ways. And that's, of course, not an orthodox tradition, as far as I know. Because in orthodoxy, somebody holds the power and holds the wisdom. And the age of 15-year-old. Here's the question, very practically speaking, yeah. doctor. What guidance can you give us as people in our community, parents, teachers, rabbis, mentors? We want to help, but we're not professionals. How can we be there in the most helpful way when people are going through tremendous suffering from trauma, PTSD, molestation? And what kind of help should we avoid? Because it might make things worse. How can we not professionals help them feel less alone, more understood? We want guidance for us. When we witness trauma in our children, our friends, what are the best responses we can be here for them? And also, how do we help our children prevent their, their trauma from becoming internalized, from ruining their lives? Right. Well, I think, I think you start by observing people's behavior. And if something goes really wrong, like your kid won't show up at the table or your kid won't go to bed or your kid leaves the house at 11 o'clock at night and doesn't come back, uh, to really think about what is going on here. Huh? To not go to, this is a bad person. This, uh, I think most kids... Curious. 
don't want to hurt their parents. They may be adolescents and say very blunt and unpleasant things, but it's very important to think that. Doctor, doctor, I just got to chime in. Can you please say that again? And let's all pause and hear it. Most kids, what? Don't want to hurt their parents. And I think kids by and large and people in general do the best they can. And um, so they try. And if your kid goes to an extreme, like taking drugs, you really need to go like, wow, things were so bad because my kid knew that heroin would be dangerous. So he must have felt pretty damn awful to start resorting to taking drugs that eventually will kill him or make him into a criminal. What is going on with us that my kid doesn't feel safe at home and that my kid uh, feels so agitated that he needs to t- do stuff to control that body of his from exploding? Uh, it's really important. And it's very important to listen to people and to, to really hear wh- what do you think about this and to uh, say, so, you know, the Orthodox community is so great in talking but maybe talking about abstract ideas and not so much talking about my feelings and my internal world. And I think in every spiritual tradition at the end, coming to terms with the internal world is always the critical issue. But here's my question. Many parents say this to me. They say, I don't understand. We have been taught that discipline is the right way with children. Why should we make the switch? Why not smack? It worked on us. Well, no, it didn't work on you because you have become a smacker <laughs> and you're hurting your kids and you were probably hurt yourself when people were smacking you, but there was nothing in your culture that allowed you to say, hey, stop hitting me for God's sake. Is there ever room for just saying my teenager has evil like all of us have and they're just doing the wrong thing and it's not trying? No. No, it's not okay to tell your kid they're evil. Huh? They may do things that piss you off or may things that disturb you or things that you may be very upset about, but calling somebody evil means you have crossed the line and there's no redemption. It's abuse. Uh, that's abuse. Uh, uh, and it's very important that to... to to have a basic attitude is you're a precious person. I love you no matter what, but there are certain things you do that are really upsetting to me and that are not okay. If you take drugs at home, it's not okay. And there are certain things that are not okay with the rules of this house. How do I, ident- how do I identify when my child is actually responding to a trauma and they're not choosing this? And I just have to be understanding of that. You always have to be understanding. It's a damn thing. You shouldn't get a license to become a parent until you have passed your understanding my kid's exam. (laughs) That's what you have to be as a parent. You have to be the parent to the child. And what we see in our research is that many kids are appointed to take care of their defective parents. Or your mom has an eating disorder or your mom has obsessive compulsive disorder, or your mom cuts herself, you better take care of mom. Huh? And so you, you, kids are appointed not to be kids, but to take care of adults, which they don't know how to do. Wow. If so much of our identity is developing on a subconscious body level, oh, from absolutely. the survival reptilian mammalian brain, yeah. Yeah. it seems that we have less choices than we think we do. In other oh, words, yeah. choice comes in only once we begin to heal and release yeah. some survival brain activity. Yeah. Do we have Absolutely. choices when we have trauma? But we have to see things first. Huh? So we we have habits. Huh? We always do the same thing as long as we can get away with it. And not until somebody says, I can no longer stand being with you if you keep yelling at the dinner table, uh, that a person say, oh, I lost my family because I was yelling at them. Oh. Uh, that was really a bad thing to do. Until everybody says, you're the father and you can do whatever you want to do, you're not going to change your habits. And it's a very big thing in families around the world, but particularly maybe in Orthodox families, is that women uh, defer to their husbands and say, oh, honey, your, your dad is hurt and that's why he screams at you, but it doesn't mean anything. Yes, it means something. And... Uh, uh, 
a spouse has the obligation to tell their spouse, stop abusing your kids. Right. Uh, one of the hardest things for people who have, have been abused is that they have one parent who abuses them and the other parent who stands by and permits this to happen. Challenge is, can you explain why being very bright and smart is not helpful for the traumatized brain? Why does cleverness work against so many people? No, I wouldn't say that. I think intelligence is a good thing. Okay, you know, thank I, you. And I, and I keep seeing in the patients that I've seen, and I've seen uh, innumerable patients, that if you're smart, you're more able to, to see different connections and different relationships. And being smart really helps. But you have to use your smartness to really understand yourself and your reactions also. Uh, so, so I think not one of the cover most, it up, not cover uh, up your way. So one of the most important things is an openness to investigate yourself, which of course is a principle of every religion also, but it often that is a piece that gets shoved aside. Huh? So if I'm if I'm really if I'm really traumatized, does it really mean that in many ways I have no choice? I'm just responding like a reptile, like a crocodile. That's right. That's right. Or like and a chimpanzee. Yeah. Uh, well, chimpanzees a wounded, have a, a wounded forward. gorilla, a wounded right. chimpanzee. Right. Rabbi Ira, you're walking us into this topic of Bechira, and we're all going to have questions to you after this. Mm, this but it's important to understand what the doctor is saying is that. When we are in such a primitive, broken state, we're, we're, we're triggered and we're responding instinctively, and choice begins with healing, right? Choice. Yeah. Am uh, I right? But, but that's why we need each other. And so right. you have your automatic reaction, and your wife or your husband will say, honey, you're really upset. Let's go for a little walk, because right now you're really upset, and the kids with this yelling and screaming or whatever we're doing, and that's why we need... But that's why we live in couples. Uh, so we can keep each other on the straight and narrow. And if we don't do that, we will get out of control. I think people very easily get out of control. Uh, but it's really our community and our families that say, no, this is not acceptable. This is not okay. And then you blow up again. You say, honey, you have an anger problem. And you're hurting people around you. And we cannot go on in this family until you do some work on what is making you so angry, so you can learn to control that anger of yours. And otherwise, we will have to leave you. How do they control their anger? They learn to, to, um, to feel compassion for that wounded part of themselves. They need to meet that wounded part of themselves. Say, I'm so hurt. I'm feeling so scared. I'm feeling so powerless that when my kid once again picks up an iPhone at the dinner table and doesn't listen to the group, uh, that uh, I feel that helplessness and I start exploding because I feel so enraged that nobody is listening to me. And instead of saying calmly, hey, remember, we have a rule around the table that we don't pick up our iPhone. And so if you want to go on your iPhone, we have 20 more minutes of, of dinner and you cannot eat with us un, unless you put your device on, on the side. And so you need to be thoughtful and wise. That's what we have brains for and we have intelligence for to become wise and not to blow up at people. And But we need that feedback from each other. One of the patients at Fresh Start, they, they put in a lot of questions. She asks... What can I do when I reach a stuck place? The trauma is stuck in my body. It doesn't let me move forward. Right. My body just wants to stay in stagnation. How do right. I begin to proceed, yeah. to, to move so, on? So what I've been urging them to do in the program, to have a lot of exercises about how people can calm themselves down. Huh? So you can tap at your pressure points, or you can go for a walk, or you can... Um, change your breathing. Uh, breathing is a very powerful thing. Or you can uh, uh, do something rhythmical, like playing tennis or squash, so to get, get the rhythm out of your body. But you need to learn how you can control yourself. And that's a learning issue. And so the only people that can, the only way that people can learn is to actually be exposed to people who can show them how to do that. 
So my teachers have been body workers and yoga teachers and martial arts instructors and theater instructors who have all taught through techniques that are from outside of psychology how to manage your bodily reactions. Psychology is not very good at that up to this point. It will probably change, but... Well, one, of the, one of the patients of Fresh Start asked... She says, besides listening, how can I be here for someone who is feeling stuck and helpless due to their being hurt by people and childhood trauma? How can I really be there for them? Yeah, it's a, that's a bit of a large generic question. It's easier. See, I, I really love the details. Huh? And, and here, so what is upsetting you? What did people do to you? What is your reaction like? What have you found out that works and what have you found out that doesn't work? And to really do a very deep exploration, like a good scientist that I am. You really want the details. And so I cannot say, oh, if your kid is really pissed off, you should do the following and everything will be just fine. And you go really like, okay, tell me more. What was that like? Okay, what could we have done at this point? What would have been helpful? What can we do in the future to begin to imagine new possibilities and new, new habits, actually? But be very open. If you say, I'm at the end of my rope, I go like, oh, I'm so sorry. What can we do? Do you think going for a walk up the hill outside my house, which is filled with snow right now, will it help you? Or shall we put on some dance music? And shall we dance a little bit? Wouldn't it be funny if you and I are dancing right now together? Huh? Yeah. A rabbi and Offer me. some somatic experience, something with the body. Something, you know, one of the great guys who was very good at this stuff is Milton Erickson, who was a hypnosis person, well known guy, been dead for quite a long time now. He would just say things that we make like, like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> he makes these very weird comments, and you've got it. Wow, I didn't expect that. I need to wrap my head around this new thing. <laughs> so get out of your linear brain. Things need to become almost like a shock. Yeah, like a chef. A, a shock, like a shock to the body. But he wouldn't. He wouldn't punch people. He would right, just. Right. But in a like, nice way, in a funny way, exciting. About like, like wow. So you need to get out of that old habits, the old linear way of thinking. Um, and that's, that's, why, no, that's why I, I, I told Jonathan that uh, throughout my career, every other year, a super orthodox person comes to see me with all the talents and stuff. And I say, what are you doing in my office? And they say, I can't talk to anybody in my community. I have to talk to a guy like you, who is not part of the community. And, and I go like, okay, I don't know anything, good. And we can start afresh and it'll say things that are different from what everybody else has said them because I come from the different tradition. It's Dr. very- Dr. Bessel, important. Rabbi why, why I have a question regarding yeah. that that somebody wrote in. If yeah. they feel like people who feel like they're experiencing a lot of pain from our traditions, and sometimes they feel like they need a break from it in order to be able to heal, how do they do that? You know, talking about a patient like your uh, who walks into your office who looks so Jewish and the whole full, you know, the black and white and the hat and everything. Yeah. Yeah. People who just need a break for a little, but we live in these communities, we're so restricted. What will people say? How will my kids handle it? I guess from both approaches, also from Dr. Bessel and also from the Torah perspective, Rabbi YY, how does a person do that when, and we're talking about a parent, not a teenager. Yeah, you know, I think this is a, an extremely good question and something that goes against your cultural values. I think right. every kid needs to explore the world. And so if you don't like your Orthodox community in, in Brooklyn, why don't you go spend some time in Shanghai? And before too long, while you're in Shanghai, you will crave going back to the shuls on Saturday because you'll miss it. You know, Did a parent offer it to their children. You just say As to your teams? kids, explore the world. Kids have to explore the world. Rabbi, why? Why? What? I think I'm asking was... also the rabbi from the Torah perspective. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I want to put both of you on the same yeah. page. I want to get both of you to, to come to an agreement somehow. The yeah. Torah. Nobody, nobody talks about Abram's parents. Do you think, how do you, do you think Abram's mom felt when he said, I'm going to leave Ur and I'm going to go to Palestine 
and start a whole new tribe. His mom said, you can't do that to me. And he said, but I have to do it. I have to start a new, <laughs> new world. You know, like, kids need to start a new world. Uh, you what, 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 the, tell me what the doctor is telling us is that Judaism began with a child who had the courage to break. That's right. To break the pagan idols of his wow. father. In other words, the journey of faith is really a journey right. of, of discovery. That's who right. you really are right. Right. and who God really is. Right. And it's a journey of leaving. You know, and that's that's a complex issue in Jewish traditions, of course, because people have been so beleaguered and people are so justifiably paranoid about the world out there that you can say to your kids, the only place where you can feel safe is with us. And what if we also have this fear that's given to us? It's drilled into us that if you do something wrong, you're not only you're going to be hurt here, you'll be hurt in the next world. Am I going to be pun punished if I take a three-year break from Judaism? I, I, Am I going to burn in hell? I What's didn't know you guys were into the afterlife. Uh, people always told me you weren't. Uh, Gehenna is sort of a very nebulous world. Now, we're, not, we're, not, like, we're not in the second comings, but we are in the afterlife. Oh, that is actually a new... I was never quite aware of that. You can threaten people with, you'll burn in hell. I thought it was a peculiarly Christian tradition, actually. Oh, that's probably one of our, Rabbi, by the way, I'm going to let you take the floor for that. Yeah, we, we, we need healing in this. You know, I always, I always try to teach what the Baal Shem Tov, one of the greatest spiritual masters in Judaism in the 17th century, taught that in Judaism, the afterlife is really the time that each of us confronts our ultimate truth. Mm. And sometimes we're proud of it, and sometimes we're ashamed of it, and we need to go through the process of cosmic spiritual therapy. But some of us learn about the afterlife in terms of you're going to burn in hell, and God will destroy you and take vengeance on you. And it's important for all of us to know if there's a certain ritual in your religion that is destroying you, and you need to take a break, it's important for you to have a rabbi, a therapist, somebody in the community or outside of the community who understands a little bit about trauma and no. has empathy and compassion to guide you. And of course, telling your kid that you'll burn in hell is a terrible curse to put on the kid. And what you sh we should say to our children, and that's not always easy, I know, because I have kids too, is I will love you no matter what. And I know that you have to fight your way. But will God love you no matter what also? Absolutely. God is so much bigger than any of us that I cannot speak for God. And it would be from pretty a Jewish, arrogant, from a Jewish pretty perspective, arrogant to speak for God. You know, like. <laughs> from a Jewish perspective, all of existence equals love. From a Jewish well, spiritual perspective, existence equals love. Well, the moment we eliminate see, love from the vocabulary of our minds and our bodies, yeah. we're not in touch with the very truth of existence. Well, that's of course true, but we don't always, we are not always loving people. Right. Uh, and so we shouldn't fool ourselves. Right. And You're right. Always loving, you know? Right. That's uh, part of our trauma. <laughs> right. And not part of our trauma. Love, but it isn't, you know? So we have a, um, we have a participant that wants to ask a live question. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, um, Yeti, are you there? Yes, hi. Okay. Can we see your face? <laughs> I'm not doctor, very presentable doctor. right now. Doctor, you know okay. what, doctor, you know what it took to get them to put their voice? You want <laughs> I'd love to see people's faces, particularly in COVID times when we're all so cut off from each other. I love to see, I like, I enjoy all of your faces and see you smile and frown and that makes it all much more personal, you know? Yeah. So my question is like this. I've done really nice trauma healing work and I'm really happy with where I am, but I kind of have to face the damage that I've done to my kids every single day. And I'm working on it, but I would like to know is like children's healing I think looks a little bit different than the adult healing. How how can we help our children heal um, after, you know, let's say I would say I'm 75% through, uh -huh. I feel, in my journey. How do I help myself not fall back looking at what I've done to my kids and it hurts me? Yeah. 
I think it's a very important question. And it's, I think, a question that I don't know what your situation is, but I think it's important to talk to your kids and say, you know, what is going on with me is the following. And I realized how the following things really hurt you guys. And I am really sorry that I did these things because I was ignorant at this point. See, we are wired to love our parents. It is very hard to turn your back on your parents. And if your kids turn their back on you, you'd be willing to think about how hard did I make my kids' life that they won't talk to me anymore. Uh, so uh, don't blame our kids necessarily, but blame ourselves because we are wired to love our parents. You know, honor your father and your mother is not sort of a weird thing. Like, oh, my God, that's so hard. No, that comes naturally. Uh, and so to turn on your parents means that your parents aren't safe. And so when that's the case, I think it's very important to talk to your kids and say, you know, I really realize, and probably I'm not aware of all the things I did, but I know that the following things, particularly, I'm aware that this really hurt you. What do you think of that? And they will either say, yeah, you're right. Or they say, oh, no, that wasn't the least of this. Let me tell you what really happened. And it's that honest dialogue between you and other people that that can begin to restore the integrity of your parent-child relationship. Um, and uh, But they really need to see that you are no longer doing what you blame yourself for having caused in them. So they need to really see how sincere you are about your efforts to undo the damage. But, but don't, we, don't we screw up our kids by showing them that we're just regular, real human beings instead of... Oh, absolutely. Be sure you kids never know that you're a regular human being. Like, <laughs> Could we back up a minute to maybe yeah. one of the other questions that we had um, regarding also to the question that was just asked out loud? It's like, we also, oh, Rabbi, why would I just ask Dr. Bessel, how, we, when do we start healing? It's usually when we're in a relationship. It, it almost seems like impossible because... How do we deal with our healing at the same time that we're parenting? So many of us just realize the trauma that we went through only once we're in a relationship and once we have kids, because that's when that's trauma right. comes out. That's right. And right. then we have to be able to somehow do our healing, but also bring up kids who are not screwed up because of us as we're screwed up and we feel like newborns. Well, that's so right. How do we deal with that? That is the reality is that, don't have kids until you're really ready to take on all these burdens because it's not a trivial matter to have kids. And as the poet says, they screw you up, your mom and dad, and you're likely to screw up your kids. So what are you going to do to prepare yourself to, uh, to be as good a parent as you can be? Um, and yes, if you have kids, you need to deal with your own trauma. You need to deal with your family. It's a big job. It's a big job. So yeah. there's no real way to prep for it. It's not like, oh, uh, let me raise my kids and after my kids are grown up. And then, then I'll bring another, up, another set of kids. I'll work on my trauma. No, no, no. no. Um, we have another question here. Hold on one moment from Rifki. Rifki, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, hi. Okay, this is very, um, very good and practical. Thank you. I have a question. Many times I get triggered and I feel like I'm in a state of panic. Yeah. Sometimes I'm not home. I'm in anywhere. Yeah. What's the best tool to come back to myself? Is it um, breathing? Well, that's something that you have to discover and you need guidance in that. So you need to work with people who actually know how to help people to regulate themselves through breathing or tapping acupressure point or through rhythms. But so you need to discover that. Actually, uh, we are hope to finish our workbook for the Body Keeps the Score in the next month or so, if you're lucky. And we have those exercises in, in our book. And some of these exercises may mean like, you will go like, that doesn't, that's nonsense. That doesn't work for me. And you'll try something else and you go like, yeah, that works for me. So you need to discover how you can calm yourself down. 
And what's also important in this respect, something that um, I've been studying and some of my colleagues also over the past 10 years, something called neurofeedback. That if you're living with a brain that's continuously frightened and hyper aroused, you can do play computer games with your own brain to help your brain wiring to calm itself down. But if indeed, if you find yourself being triggered, getting out of control, becoming overly angry all the time, you need to discover how you can take care of that body of yours to calm your body down. An important part of that, to my mind, is also having somebody work with your body. I don't know how well that sits in the Orthodox community, uh, but you know, your body is the engine of your agitation and your fear and your dissociation. And uh, the way you calm a little baby down is by holding them and touching them. And I think holding and touching your physical input is a very important part of learning to control yourself. And so an important part of every healing journey is to find somebody who is a body worker who can work to make you feel safe to live in your body. There's always a journey of discovery. There is no directories for great body workers. Um, I lucked out when I moved to this little village I live in, the Berkshires. The, my closest neighbor happens to be a spectacular body worker. I lucked out. Uh, and I go and get my body work every week because these are very hard times. And he helps my body to feel calm and full. Um, and so I don't know how, I doubt whether the Orthodox community is very open to people touching your body. Uh, that may not be. Rabbi, Rabbi, we break it down to be practical. Like, what do you mean body work? Like, like Feldenkrais? Like, like what kind of. Christ? Like, so there's different schools of thoughts. And at the end, I don't know if it makes a great deal of difference, but Feldenkrais, you know, um, Ben-Gurion was best friends with Moshe Feldenkrais. And um, I think Moshe Feldenkrais helped Ben-Gurion to be a very good prime minister because he helped wow. his body to be calm. You know, <laughs> we have to learn from that. You know? Do you feel there's any body work that's more helpful than others or all of no. them? It's the person. person. So it's not the technique. It is somebody who really knows the body. And so most body workers who I know have studied Feldenkrais and they have studied cranial sacral, but at the end, they have learned something about their body and other people's bodies that helped them. But being a student of something doesn't guarantee that you're very good at it. Same I, thing with rabbis. You know? Doctor, I just want to chime in here. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, um, you have victims of, of sexual abuse yep. that you feel is very difficult. What would you tell those that went through that and, and therefore have extra trauma? Rabbi yep. Wally, I don't think that there's anything in our religion, as long as it's done within under the appropriate guidelines, prohibiting body work from a female to a female, male to a male. Uh -huh. uh, so that part's okay, but what would you tell a, a victim of sexual abuse? I would say... That is part of the damage that the trauma has done to you, that you don't feel safe in your body and you're terrified of touch. And your body is the engine of all your emotions. And they're lived out in your body. And as long as nobody can touch you, it's very hard for you to feel anything but fear and hurt and pain because your body needs to feel safe with another body in order to be okay. And so for you who have been sexually abused, uh, being touched by a person will be a great challenge, but that's exactly what you need to do because as long as your body is off limits, you cannot experience a sense of joy or pleasure because joy and pleasure are also physical sensations. And so, yes, it will be hard for you. And so maybe you want to work, and my, my wife is a body worker, and we have a bunch of, uh, of tuning forks here in the office. And when people are terrified to feel anything in the body, she starts with tuning forks. And she puts it on your chest to say, what's that like? She puts it in your arm. How is that different? And so you slowly open up people's tolerance to experience that body, which up to then has been a source of terror and fear. But uh, 
The healing of trauma consists of your liking the body you live in. Quite a challenge. Nobody's going to say that's easy or five sessions and you'll be done. No, these are very serious enterprises to change the habits of your body and your brain. Is it also important together with the body work to go back to the trauma, to reframe it, to put it in context, or that's not really so important? No, it's important to say, this is what comes up for me. When you touch my left leg, I suddenly feel this sense of panic. And so what comes up? And then, indeed, the combination of understanding yourself and being aware of yourself, but being able to talk is very important. Right? In that regard, your tradition will be very helpful. Say, I wonder what's going on with me. I wonder when you touch my little toe, I feel like smacking you. How weird is that? Let's explore that. But what about somebody says, those of us who responded to trauma through freezing, they went offline. Part of their yeah. brain is not functioning. They don't even know what's happening in their body. Right. What do you tell us? That is a very common response to trauma. And of course, all of us have known people who shut down, maybe our own mothers or our own fathers, who, when they saw terrible things, did not respond and say, stop that, but they froze. I think How do you have- begin recovery of that? Uh, you, you begin by, by uh, again, becoming aware of your own body. And I also find neurofeedback very helpful for people to to rewire the brain so you can stay online without dissociating. How How do you feel about psychedelics for this? Oh, I don't feel about psychedelics. So I have feelings about psychedelics also. I run a psychedelic laboratory. Mm. I'm actually very active in studying psychedelics. I'm not ready to have you guys jump into psychedelics. I think the way that people talk about psychedelics is oftentimes a little bit too easy. When you're traumatized and you take psychedelics, the likelihood that the pain will come up in a very profound way is very likely. So if you start taking psychedelics, it needs to be done very carefully with very experienced people. A doctor, with a therapist, with an expert. Yeah. Guided, guided psychedelic. You need to guide. You need to be there to really hold you as you as very painful stuff comes up. And I think psychedelics are very good to make you able to tolerate things that have been intolerable. Doctor, when it when it comes to talk therapy, yeah. um, where where do you? Where, you're, I, I suspect you're not referring to good old fashioned cognitive behavioral therapy. But what, what about things For like... For me, that's old-fashioned. That is like a, okay. a bit aberrant situation of okay. people who what believe that IFS? it can be reasonable. Okay. <laughs> well, what about IFS? Um, where, where do you see that being a healing well, think, part of someone's journey? I think IFS is a very, very useful technique. It's a very useful way of understanding ourselves and the people around us. And the principle of IFS is that we want to survive. And if we are threatened, we um, we isolate, we hide, we push away the hurt part of ourselves. And we, exile. They call and it exile. We exile that, <laughs> and we try to manage. And so we manage by saying, uh, oh, you're a piece of shit, that's why people do this to you. Uh, or you're no good, and that's why you feel terrible. Or if I just have A's in all my exams, I will become a lovable person. So you get all these ways of trying to cover up the pain that you feel inside of you. All these things are in the service of survival. So what we have learned over time is that cutting yourself is a way of surviving. It's not like, oh my God, you shouldn't cut yourself. It's like, oh, how interesting you cut yourself. What's, how is that help for you, for you? Oh, you starve yourself. You don't want to eat. Oh, how is that protecting you? Where did you learn this? What's been going on for a time? And so rather than condemning people for these seemingly self-destructive defenses, you go like, oh, so that was your intention was to take care of you. And somehow you discovered that starving yourself made you not feel so needy for your mom to love you. That's oftentimes has to do with 
and starving is a lot of neglect actually of I don't need anybody. Huh? And then uh, you need to slowly uncover how I really wanted somebody to there in my life, but as long as I starve myself, that feeling of needing people will go away. And and I will starve myself until a part of me is actually able to take in a little bit of the milk of human kindness. One of the participant asks. Yeah, one yeah. of the participant asks, Doctor, don't you feel that CBT can be helpful simply in exposing a person to the fact that this person or this situation is really triggering this crazy sensation? Yeah, it, it may be helpful to get a map of yourself, so you have a better, more of a perspective for yourself. But but I, I, I may be mistaken about it. My but my take on CBT is to people say, you shouldn't think that way or you shouldn't oh, feel that way. Very good. Very and important. I would never say that to a person. That's ridiculous. I, I don't say to people, you shouldn't. I mean, you say, hey, you know, my marriage is in trouble because I fell in love with this person in the office and I don't want to do it. I don't want to be unfaithful to my wife and say, oh, just don't feel, fall in love with another person. No, that's the wrong answer. You know, like, What's the right answer? The right answer is uh, what happens but what do you think is going on in your marriage that you became so vulnerable to the allurement of that particular person? And to really think about what the consequences are if you act in it. And are you prepared for it? And you may have to go in isolation in a cabin in Vermont for a while to really think about what you want to do with your life uh, uh, and to really contemplate. But most people aren't like that and they are impulsive. And they don't think very deeply about the consequences of their actions. Uh, and that's part, of course, of the contemplative wow. tradition. So, so, doctor, you're saying that when we tell somebody, we tell a child or a patient or a student, you must not think that way. It's very oh. often ludicrous. They're not choosing to think that I way. I think that's, you know, it's okay <laughs> to say that to people, but never, ever charge people for saying that to them. Because it's stupid. Like. <laughs> He's saying a teacher shouldn't take a salary if that's what he's saying. <laughs> Don't take a salary. But exploring... I mean, I, I, if I'm talking to your prefrontal cortex, I may say that, no? Yeah, but trauma is not in the prefrontal cortex. Right. I don't know if you have noticed that, but people tend to not to be all that reasonable. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we have We're not one, as rational we have, as we like to claim we, we have one more live question and then rabbi will will get into wrapping up hold on one second here uh hanania are you there yes go ahead first of all uh thank you jonathan for setting this up this has been absolutely amazing um on this what we're talking about regarding the connection between the trauma and judaism there are many times where the trauma itself has been caused because of something within Judaism. When we're dealing with having to process that, does it have to be separate from the Judaism in the healing, or does it something that can be done together with, with the with religion itself? Oh, I see absolutely no contradiction there between healing and, and being a deeply religious person. Um, I think your the religion is not against your healing itself. Uh, it may serve as a defense against healing yourself, but I would definitely not say, oh, if you're an Orthodox Jew and you, you're really hurting, you should go to a Catholic monastery to heal yourself. No. Uh, I mean, our traditions are very important to us. And, um, and our traditions are meant to be supports in the very rough world that we live in. And so celebrate your traditions and, and take the best out of it. And uh, I would... Uh, uh, unless people are really in a very destructive cult, I would never think about it as critical for people to live their religious orientation at all. Um, you can be a deeply spiritual person and be self-conscious and love your Hasidic music and your dancing and your Torah and all the rituals that you have. Nothing wrong with that. But of course, for some people, the ritual, uh, some of my friends actually, the rituals are traumatic triggers uh, because they felt very bad about it, were raised in, the, in Orthodox church, uh, Orthodox synagogue, uh, shul. And so for them, the songs that I actually love 
because I associated with my neighbors who I was close to as a kid. And so I'm very, I, I love Jew, uh, 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 positive association, campers and stuff, and the singing. Um, and if it gives you comfort, stay there. It's very important. So in those situations where the religion is that traumatic event, does that have to be something that is processed within the religion at all times? Or is that something that, that could be done or should be done separately and then come but, back to the religion? You know, that's something that needs to be figured out for every individual person. Mm -hmm. uh, um, for example, I, I acted out my adolescent rebellion by going to a monastery in France uh, called Taizé before it became a famous place. And it was of great comfort to me. And uh, I am actually very happy that in the course of my life, that I spent a good amount of three years in a monastery in a very ancient Christian tradition. And it's precious to me. And I don't associate it with trauma at all. Uh, even though my parents were also religious people who were pretty traumatizing some of the time. Yeah. So you went to religion in order to rebel? Well, you know, as an adolescent, you need to discover new worlds. And, of course, the world of mysticism and religion, uh, for many adolescents, is a very attractive world to go into. I imagine a lot of Jewish kids become, may become very, uh, very deeply orthodox as adolescents as a way of dealing with all that stuff that's going on with them. And I would in no way condemn that. Just tell the crowd that uh, Dr. Bessel shared with me that his father suffered terribly under the Nazis. So I assume that's also part of what you grew up with. Yes, but I think for my parents, and I don't talk about it in my book, their, um, their family situations were more powerful as an influence than the Nazis did, actually. And I found that to be true for some Jewish Holocaust survivors. Heard that... Uh, I don't want to mention their names, uh, but some of you know some of the people. Uh, we know some uh, some well-known uh, Holocaust survivors who actually grew up to be quite loving people after the Holocaust. Right. And I would I would actually attribute to that to them having very loving early childhood experience that was lodged in their brain. And even though so they saw this horror. Uh, they still had this internal imprint of love in their earlier life. And of course, and some people went to the Holocaust from abusive families. And then it's very easy to say the Holocaust caused everything, but that may not be entirely the case either. Not to minimize the Holocaust in any way, shape or form. But uh, it wasn't just that. Huh? Wow. Back to question. What does it look like when a child feels like a failure throughout their childhood? No one abusive event, fine parents, but a prolonged feeling that I'm just a loser. You know, what does that do to the child? I don't really believe that kids have that feeling without getting some reinforcements from their parents or their schools or somebody. Right, and if they're getting the reinforcement from their schools, yeah. they're because, failing there. You know, because I... I live with, and I wish I lived with them, but I don't. I, I, I am in regular contact with grandchildren. And kids are naturally curious and open. And if they feel loved, they play and they explore the world and they don't become obsessed with their inadequacies. And so if a kid has a feeling of, I'm a failure, I'm no good, you really want to think about, am I expecting something from this kid that this kid is unable to do? And should I change my standards? And that's very hard. Huh? If you're like me and you're sort of professor type person, uh, scientist type person, and your kids have absolutely no interest in science, uh, it would be very easy for me to give a subtle message to my kids, which I may actually have done, of you're no good if you become an artist. Huh? And then your kids struggle with that. And that marks their lives. And, you know, we need to have a little sense of irony is that life is messy and being a parent is messy and none of us does a perfect job. And I can say to my kids, you know, I'm sorry you became an artist and not a scientist, uh, but I love you the way you are. And I'm sorry that I put my expectation on you, but you know, 
I'm a flawed human being as a dad. I say, I know you're flawed, dad, and I love you anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is, is just being a holding presence for a child yeah. going to help them with resilience that the trauma shouldn't destroy them emotionally? So the core issue is you need to be a parent. And so our job is to have our shit together and to be generous and curious and open-minded about the life of our children. And the more we have done our own work as parents, the more we can treat our children with generosity. But we always pass our own uptightness and our own complexes onto our kids. We will. No matter how hard you try, you'll mess your kids up. If you could speak, Dr. Bessel, yeah. if you could speak to every Jewish parent, young adult, educator, what would you tell them? Oh, that's too hard. That's too hard. I, I, I would have to think about it. I'm not sure if I could, if I could condense it in one sentence. You, do you have a message to the world? What's your message to the world? Huh. I don't mean to trigger well, anything. Well, good about asking me that question, but now we ask you the question. <laughs> Checkmate. <laughs> okay, we have what to think about. One of the participants says... Maybe that will start, be in our follow-up. One of the participants in, in Fresh Start says, I'm triggered. I see certain people and I get triggered terribly. Yep. Next time I'm triggered by seeing somebody, for example. Can you walk me through a one, two, three minute process to be aware of what's happening and what I can do about it. I'm triggered by my teenager, by my mother, my brother, my sister, my boss. Well, I would say then get a spiritual practice that helps you to be still. And what is there available in your religion, your community that allows you to be still? Is there a meditation group? Is there a chanting group? Is there a movement group, uh, uh, the, the most important message, as I think about it, to give to parents is to be a parent. And being a parent means that you need to be a living example of somebody who has their shit together. How did and you so, get your, uh, your stuff together? <laughs> okay, you, thank you for cleaning up what I'm saying. Um, you get your stuff together by coming to terms with your own past and your own relationship to your own parents, and your own relationship to your own tradition, and your relationship to your spouse. But how do you do that? How do you do that? By being honest about it and living with people who are willing to face reality. Uh, and not in a community where you say, you should feel this way and you should think that way. But the Passion, community is, compassion. Yeah, that's open for a variety of uh, capacities and gifts. Uh, but also a community is able to see the flaws in everybody uh, and that none of us are perfect and uh, and compassion for ourselves and compassion for the people around us. Uh, Dr. Bessel, Dr. Bessel, you, you just mentioned one thing. I just want to clarify. Coming to terms with our past or our present, etc., doesn't necessarily mean re-engaging with abusive relationships. No. Okay. No, it's really coming to terms with, oh, uh, so my dad, I, I, I know what, what my, I, I can reconstruct what happened to my dad. And so that was where he came from. Oh, and because that's where he came from, he couldn't always appreciate what a wonderful kids he had because he was so preoccupied with that danger might befall people, that he was more worried about whether I would cross the street than that I was uh, happy with my friends. And now I understand that that's where my dad came from. And I feel badly that he didn't enjoy his kids as much as I wish he had. Uh, and that's coming with terms of your past with the imperfections of the people who came before you. And that I think will help your kids to deal with the imperfections that you have inflicted on them in turn. Wow. I just want to mention, and also for the doctor, for all of us, that the, the great spiritual masters in Judaism they didn't just speak about meditation, but they encouraged it every single day, hmm. at least three times a day. Yeah. To meditate in stillness and silence and yeah. openness to 
to infinity, to truth, yeah. to the self, yeah. to God, etc. Yeah, stillness is a very important part of every good practice. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the motto of Judaism is Shema Yisrael. Listen, don't talk. Yeah. Listen. listen. Uh, deny, you know, you know. <laughs> Shema, listen, right. To listen, to really be open. So, so somebody asks, when somebody opens up to me or to a parent or to a rabbi the first time, yeah. what, what's, what's the, these, we are the first responders. What do I say? What don't I say? Oh, you, you're there. I'm and there. What does that mean to be yeah, there? You allow yourself to feel what comes up inside of you and allow yourself what it triggers in you and to go like, that must have been very hard. Or that must have been, uh, must make you so angry. Or I can understand why you wanted to kill yourself after that wow. happened to you. And what allowed you to go on uh, after this terrible thing, this terrible disappointment happened to you. And I really want to get to know this person. I think the greatest protection against trauma is somebody who knows you. Huh? I think that's part of the pandemic is that we don't make new friends uh, when we on screen. Uh, we are out of touch with each other. These are the hard times because this sort of vital interaction between us and other people gets pretty, uh, pretty uh, difficult. And maybe some religious communities don't want to take vaccinations because it will keep them away from each other. But you still need to follow science also and know that the price of what we're going through right now is a lot of interpersonal distance and how hard it is on us. And we need to say right. it's hard. It's hard. How do I know when the therapist is right for me or wrong for me? Ah, that's a very good question. Because some of us are so vulnerable. We're so vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. Right. We're all vulnerable. And I think it's very important for every one of us to be in touch with our vulnerability. Could we tap this question, make it even a little more? What type of therapist? There's so many types out there. At the end... The training does not make all the difference. Wow. It's really how in touch with themselves the person is, how much work they have done. And there are certain techniques that I like a lot. And That's I, very, very serious what you're saying. But it's not <laughs> the, the training technique. doesn't matter as much as how much the well, therapist is. It doesn't matter, but, but boy, right. at the end, you, so how do you know you're the right therapist? If you don't feel scared of your therapist, mm -hmm. if you feel like your therapist is interested in you, but I see in my profession more and more because we have this crazy diagnostic system that's completely not scientific and it's stupid called the DSM. Have people try to say or label you? Oh, you're borderline. You're bipolar. That's not scientific. Who are you? And Every person is unique. But that's what every psychiatrist does. You're bipolar. You're yeah. schizophrenic. You're borderline. So maybe you shouldn't go to a psychiatrist who does that because they see a diagnosis and they don't see a human. Mm. You need to be seen. Your parents need to see you. Your doctor needs to see you as the unique individual that you are. Wow. So you feel much of mental illness is basically due to trauma? Oh, yeah. Not all of it. But uh, we have our makeup and our genetics, etc. But it's unequivocal that trauma makes people much more vulnerable to develop any of these numbers. So that's revolutionary. That's revolutionary. Because yeah. Bipolar, bipolar teenagers or youngsters are being treated just with medicine. You're bipolar, yeah. you're mentally ill, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, that's Doctor, I, I want to chime in here for a quick second because I know that you're, you're what we call a yeki. A Yeki is a German Jew. Dutch, that's Dutch, very prompt. Dutch. <laughs> Dutch. But you're very prompt with time. So I know we only have like a few minutes right. left. We, we just got an interesting question that I think uh, uh, is appropriate for many people watching this. When is the time to disassociate with a person who is causing you trauma? How much understanding should we have? What's that balance between just regular human interaction or traumatic interaction, I guess, is the question. I think that's a very important question. And that's a question of your internal courage. And of course, if you think that I'm no good and nobody else will love me, you'll put up with any amount of crap from somebody else. 
But if you know that you're a valuable person, and if you happen to really care for this creature that you are, you say, I don't want this creature, who is me, to be hurt anymore. And it takes an enormous courage to say, honey, I know you're trying, but this is just too hurtful, and I'm moving out. But that raises all kinds of issues of wow. financial dependence and emotional dependence. And, and I'm always incredibly impressed with people who don't have a lot of education, a lot of background, who have the courage to say, no, I will leave this relationship because it's doing me too much hurt and I'll go it out on my own. And that takes an enormous amount of courage particularly if you already feel very bad about yourself. And I think that's where we can, as friends and members of a congregation, help each other and say, honey, I've seen how your spouse treats you and I wish you would protect yourself more. And I'll be there for you no matter what. If you leave your spouse, I'll still be your friend. But as everybody knows, this is a very delicate thing because oftentimes when you leave a relationship, you don't only leave that relationship, but you leave a lot of people who come with that relationship. And to make that decision is an agonizing decision, which takes a lot of support and a lot of um, encouragement and a lot of introspection. One last question. Have you seen mental illness patients heal through body work? I've seen any number of very severely traumatized people get very much better, profoundly better, not only through body work. I think the body work is just one part of the whole puzzle. People also need to be able to tell the truth and to say, this is what happened to me and this is what it's like for me. And people need to get to know themselves and treat themselves, I'd like to say, it's as if you get a newborn puppy. And you need to treat yourself like that puppy, <laughs> you know, and walk it and treasure it and put newspapers under it. Treat that creature who you are like you would like to, anybody else to be treated. Like. That's amazing. There's a, verse, there's a verse in Job, a verse in Job that captures your work. He says, from my flesh, I perceive God. So one of the great masters said, when we look deep into the flesh, we right. find ultimate truth. We do. And my, my father was on his deathbed. I read the book of Job to him. Wow. And it was a great comfort to him. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Would you do this with us again? <laughs> I, I enjoyed this a, a lot. Now, I'm really a Jew at heart. You know, I love arguing with people. I think, yeah, but on the other hand. You know, like, <laughs> we'll make it even more challenging next time then. Doc. Welcome to the club. Thank yeah. you so much for what you do for us and for what you do for the whole world and for yeah. thousands and millions of people. Thank you. Doctor, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. Dr. Stephen Poor just told us that one of the worst days of your life was when your 23 and me uh, results came back. And you realized you <laughs> that's that's right. one third Jewish. That's right. The myth in my family was my grandmother was Jewish. And yeah. that's how I got his nose. Yeah. And then I was sure that my son actually applied for this homecoming thing, this Israel thing, uh, where young people go to Israel to be indoctrinated. Oh, birthright. Birthright. Birth, birthright. My son applied to birthright. He was rejected. And he was so angry about it. He said, I'm part Jewish. So he went to Israel by himself and to Egypt. Oh, and why, why? You can help him with that, can't you? All right, we'll talk off. <laughs> so, you know, that's part of the life. You, you have to mourn your losses. And one of the things I had to mourn is that, no, I don't have Jewish ancestry. Like, okay, how well, come I can we'll, be funny? Like, <laughs> we'll, give you, we'll give you everything you're missing. Okay, thank you. Great. Besides the trauma. Wow. That's You're part of Fresh Start for now. Yeah. All the trauma and the tourists. Like, thank you for the tourists. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, you're part of Fresh Start. If you couldn't be part of Judaism, you're part of us. Okay. See you thank soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. 
please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.